Um, as you know, my name is Andrew Parkin, director of the Mowat Center. It's my great honor to try and do justice to this panel and, uh, and facilitate the discussion. I'll do that at the beginning by giving a brief introduction to the three speakers, and then we're going to keep the, the same format. Um, I'll invite each of them to, uh, to talk for a little while to get the discussion rolling. We'll have a bit of a conversation among ourselves, and then I'll, I'll invite uh, some questions from the floor as uh, we should have plenty of time for, uh, for your contributions as well. So I would like to introduce uh, Leslie Wideye, who is a consultant, facilitator, and speaker. She's former chief of the Chippewas of the Thames Valley and the nation's first elected woman chief. She's an Anish Nishtabi Ojibwe from the Great Lakes region, and she is currently providing education and indigenous consulting services at the structural, as, sorry, as the structural Re readiness coordinator for eight First Nations in Ontario seeking jurisdiction over education. Deborah Richardson is the Deputy Minister for the Ontario Ministry of Indigenous Re uh, Relations and Reconciliation. I think, Deborah, you must be right at home here on Bay Street, because if I understand, you started your career in the banking sector. Um, but about 13 years ago, she was recruited into the federal public service uh, with Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Affairs Canada. Uh, and then about five years ago, uh, luckily for us, she was recruited here in Ontario to be the Assistant Deputy Minister for the Ring of Fire Secretariat at the Ontario Ministry of Northern Development and Mines, and then subsequently moved over uh, to her current ministry. Um, welcome, uh, Deborah. And uh, Bob Ray is a lawyer. <laughs> there you go. Um, no, there's more here. Um, Bob Ray served as Ontario's 21st Premier from 1990 to 1995 and was interim federal leader of the Liberal Party. Uh, for two years uh, uh, before the, uh, the current guy took over. Um, uh, it, it, Bob, your, your current, the exact nature of your current role uh, is not written here, but as, as you will know that uh, the Bob has been asked to advise the Canadian government on dealing with the crisis in, in Myanmar. Uh, and in, in that context, we're all the more uh, appreciative of the time he's taken uh, to be with us today. Uh, so I'm gonna ask Leslie to, uh, to get the conversation going. Um, I, in, I invite you to, to, uh, to share the remarks that, that you wish to, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pose a question just to, to get it going, which I think I can, I can take it for granted. Two things about this audience. This is a largely non-Indigenous audience, I think it's, it's fair to say, um, but probably largely well-meaning. Um, and so in, in that context, I'm wondering what you think this audience needs to understand about reconciliation. So I think it's important that um, part of the reconciliation work is the truth work. And part of the truth telling is that you have to give space for First Nation, uh, Métis and Inuit uh, communities to tell them about themselves, tell them about their, tell them, allow them to tell you about their aspirations and who they are and where they come from and what, what, what are their structures that, that they, um, are so actively right now working in their communities to reestablish. And, and that's a key part of the question, is the reestablishment. I know at Chippewa, we've worked really hard to rethink about our relational law, our sacred law, our natural law, those things that our ancestors tell us um, situate and really create the structures for governance in our communities. Um, today as they did a long time ago before contact. But when you have these conversations with the, the very folks across the table that are uh, tasked with nation-to-nation relations, it's a difficult conversation to have because you have to talk outside of a, uh, of a framework with which they're used to having to work in. In so many cases, they can't even go out of. They don't have the mandate to. And so I think that when you talk about reconciliation, um, you're going to have to allow yourself to be open, to think differently about the work. And if, you're, if you're, your structures, your governance, um, your, um, I guess those levels of authority uh, aren't giving the mandate to do so, then we're going to need you to be an ally in that. Because this, real, this change is not going to happen without that. Um, and then I think the other part about this is the work in terms of allyship is, is just that. It's not about governments, whether it be federal or provincial or even municipal, reading a bunch of long uh, lists of really deplorable statistics 
to come to arms and say, well, this is what we can do for you. Uh, I think those days um, have been long over, that really the, the um, solutions, the creativity, the ability to do things differently in our community have always been there. We just, they're just under-resourced. And so if you could come to the table in that regard, open to listen, to observe, to, to want to participate, to learn more, to engage, to build a deeper uh, understanding and a, a deeper um, um, want to know of what that other worldview is and what that other perspective is, I think we're going to be in a really good place for reconciliation going forward in Canada. Thank you. Deborah. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how it, it, it looks from your perspective, partly about how governments are engaging with the, the issue, but also how it looks internally within the government, because I would, I would imagine there are processes that are not so much about the policies the government projects outward, but just, just how the issue is, uh, is managed uh, within the context of, of, of government uh, it, itself. Uh, so if you could uh, speak to that. Sure, I, I really notice a shift. Um, I came into the provincial government probably in 2008, but I think it is important to do a little walk down memory lane about some of the things that have happened in the Canadian landscape to encourage provinces to operate a little bit differently. So, I mean, even when you look at 1982 and the changes of the recognition of Aboriginal and treaty rights in the Constitution, that was a pretty significant shift from a provincial perspective because all of a sudden you had to figure out, okay, there's all these land claims um, that, uh, you know, typically provincial governments um, had kind of said this is a federal issue, but oftentimes it was a provincial issue. So we actually came to the table um, in 1990 with the first um, actually bringing land to the table and Canada would bring money. So there was starting to be a shift in terms of harvesting. All of a sudden the Constitution recognized harvesting rights. So all of a sudden on the ground, ministers of natural resources uh, right across the province, or country had to start to put things in place around harvesting. And then courts start to dictate things, which is what provinces I think are starting to wake up to, at least in Ontario. We don't necessarily want to wait for what courts have to say. Why not be more proactive about and making policy changes? So I can just speak to perhaps even in 2008, um, when I came into the province, we were not allowed, meaning we didn't have a mandate, which Leslie spoke to, to use the word government to government in an agreement. We had to actually go and get a mandate to use those words in, in a legal agreement. So it's slowly starting to build those blocks about what are the barriers and how do we start to tear down those barriers within government. So the first thing we did is, we dealt with the government to government. Then we, then we managed to get a mandate to actually talk about, talk about jurisdiction. Because those of you who may or may not work with Indigenous partners, jurisdiction is often used at tables. And government officials who don't, aren't well versed in the area, often their eyes glaze over, mm -hmm. they don't have a mandate. They're sort of paralyzed on how to, how to respond. What jurisdiction means is what, what uh, Leslie spoke to is, we have our laws, we have our way, we've operated quite effectively and because of different policies that federal and provincial governments have put in place, you know, we, we, it's held us back. Um, so putting those things in place, so we were able to get a mandate to talk about jurisdiction, enhancing Indigenous voices and control, we called it, um, and it meant the whole spectrum about participating on boards, co-design and co-delivery of programs and services with, with the ultimate spectrum of self-government, government get out of the way, um, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in child and family services, that's the trend that we're going towards. So internally, we're really fortunate right now because it's in every single mandate letter. When it's in every mandate letter, um, deputy ministers are very interested in the issues. When your boss, the Secretary of Cabinet, is my boss, um, is very interested and passionate about the issues, it becomes a lot easier. Um, so that has, has really helped us. So we started to deal with the internal things around jurisdiction, Aboriginal and, and treaty rights. We, we never talked about treaties before. So what does that mean? Well, we got a mandate to go out and talk to Indigenous partners about what that actually means. 
We now have put mandatory treaty awareness training in schools. We now have put um, legislated Treaty Awareness Week across the province, the second week in November. So slowly you start to build that consciousness um, in, in the non-Indigenous world and with kids, right? Kids are the ones that learn these things. Um, so that's how we, we started. And then of course the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I think if, if those of you who are non-Indigenous people have not read it, I really encourage you to read uh, at least the executive summary to understand what actually happened as a result of policy, Canadian policy, to take the Indian out of the child. Um, and the implications of that, and that's why the data um, tells a story. Yes, you know, you don't want to focus on the data, but the data creates a compelling argument to do things differently than we do. Thank you. Um, so I apologize as I, I have really haven't done a good job on any of the intros that I've given today, but Bob, I neglected to mention that uh, you, you are, as well as doing work outside the country, you've been uh, acting as legal counsel, I think, to a number of First Nations, um, and particularly around development issues. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, about that work, maybe a bit about the issue of, of prior free and informed consent. And, and I think my question is really, are, 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 are we non-Indigenous people, are we close to getting what that actually really means? Um, well, it depends on the day that I wake up uh, as to whether I feel we're really moving on this big train uh, that's going somewhere or whether I feel that uh, there's just too many people who don't get it. I mean, one of the, one of the hard realities of, of this topic and this, this whole subject in our in our lives, um, which is that 95% of the population is, is non-indigenous, more or less. We can all argue about you know, the definition of, it, of who is an indigenous person, but the fact is, is that the, the, the population relationship is way out of whack. And, and what that means is that in my view, in, in my sort of lifetime, um, we've really seen a major shifting in policy and awareness that's been driven by a lot of things. It's been driven in part by uh, an extraordinary um, revolution uh, in Indigenous leadership and presence in the country uh, that rose up and said no to the white paper in 1968 in a way that totally surprised uh, the governments of the day. Uh, and that generation of leadership has been succeeded by others which are um, increasingly um, uh, really well versed in negotiation and politics and policy and issues uh, and um, are a guarantee that this issue will not go away. The other is reason that it won't go away is because of the courts. And uh, Deborah mentioned 1982. <clears throat> I, was, I was there in 1982 as a member of parliament, and I can recall Mr. Trudeau saying to me, um, Junior, because that was his name that he used to call me, uh, what, what, what does this section 35, what is it all about? Because it was a, the, the politics of the day, the, the liberal government of the day needed the New Democratic Party, of which I was a member, uh, to uh, support the, the patriation. And we went through, well, what, what, what does it mean to, to refer to existing rights and treaties? What do you think it means? Because he was very reluctant to do this. And I said, well, what, is, what does freedom of assembly mean? I mean, the court is going to tell us in a different circumstance, in different ways, what it means. But what I know it means is, is that if we don't put this in and we don't put the Royal Proclamation in, you will have indigenous opposition and you may well not get the result that you want. So that was the fundamental step that happened. And then the courts have taken those words and as, as Deborah and Le Leslie have said, have turned that into something more. Uh, and this, this has really a couple of things going on. Doug talked about demographics a lot, which is an interest of mine as well. The demographic revolution is one in which the majority of Aboriginal people now live in cities. 
which means that most of us, whether we know it or not, have indigenous neighbors. I grew up in Ottawa. When I was a kid, I never saw or met an Aboriginal person that I was aware of. I saw them on television, but I didn't, they weren't my neighbors. And that's not true anymore. And certainly if you go to the northern cities or western cities, it's really not true. And people understand it better and better. The second thing that's happening is that as the resource industry extends deeper, far north and in west, uh, it, and into rural, deep into rural and deep into indigenous treaty territory, there is a very powerful reason why you know, it matters and why non-indigenous people really don't have much of a choice. You might like to think, well, I don't have to care. You sort of say, well, you know, you kind of do uh, because the law says you do and because the economy is increasingly telling you that you do. And by the way, the state of your cities is telling you that you do. So these are all reasons why this is, even though it's numerically may not be a huge issue, in fact, because of the way in which things are constructed, it is a tremendous issue. Have we fully understood what free prior and informed consent means? No, not yet. Governments are just coming to it. It's worth pointing out <coughs> that the federal government has endorsed this phrase, which comes not from the Supreme Court of Canada, but comes from the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. But no province has as yet said, this is our policy. When it comes to resource development, we accept very explicitly, we embrace the notion that the First Nations must have consented in a free way, in a way that's informed and that goes prior to development. No province has yet done that. But as Deborah has pointed out, the provinces are absolutely key to the future of indigenous government relationships. In fact, I would argue the provinces are even more important than the federal government because the provinces have control over natural resources, have control over education and health, and have control over so many other issues that are tied up in the jurisdictional issues that, that Deborah uh, talked about. However, uh, I would close on an optimistic note, and that is to say that actually, when you compare where we were as a country in 1967-68, when the First Nations were not even an afterthought in any of the federal provincial discussions. Today, the First Nations have to be at the center of the national dialogue. Not because only, not only because it's the right thing to do, and it's the, it's the moral and conscientious thing for us to do, but because it's actually what we have to do. Uh, and that, I think, is something that has been part of the revolution of the last 50 years, uh, which is a revolution which is ongoing and is not going to, to stop or disappear or evaporate. It will continue to be very, a very real thing. Thank you. But just to uh, keep the conversation going, pick up on uh, something that Deborah mentioned. You, you talked about the, the mandate letters. Um, so, you know, the first people to read your mandate that are yourself and, and your colleagues, the, the next sort of circle of people who read deputy ministers and ministers' mandate letters are, are probably a number of people in this room. Um, but it's a question of beyond this, this sort of circle of, of people who fo follow the policy issues very closely. And I'd like to ask whether you think, and ask this to all of you, that there's a gap opening up or there's a gap that just exists between where the public may be at and, and where those who are kind of working on these issues, either directly involved or, or, or the, the, the sort of policy community. If you, if you take the United Nations declaration that, that Bob mentioned, I think, in my own personal view, the, the public may be comfortable with the fact that we now have a federal government that has endorsed it, whereas previously we were, we were on the outside looking in and Canadians aren't normally comfortable with that. Um, so, so there's a general public awareness that something happened and maybe public support for that. But the, the question is, is there a danger that the most public thinks that then it's done? Right? We told the UN we're on board. Um, whereas I'm, I'm, I would venture to say that perhaps for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people that that was, that was the starting point of something and not the end. So 
the simple question is, is, um, is there a discontinuity between the type of conversation that you're having um, and, and, and Bob and the folks in this room and, and the sort of general uh, space where Canadians are? Uh, maybe I could, I could start. Um, I, think, I think so, absolutely, right? The, especially when you're in the Indigenous space, you're kind of in, in, in that vacuum of knowledge. And I think that a lot of people don't know what the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People um, are or what's in it. They see the federal government endorse it, but when, when it hits the ground, oftentimes it is provinces or municipalities or for First Nations um, directly that are most impacted. So I think that the only way of tackling something like that is, you know, through a broader public awareness, but it's almost subject matter. So for example, as we're starting to recognize child well, Indigenous child well-being laws and moving out of um, the Child and Family Services Act for Indigenous groups that um, opt in, as we start to move towards that, we will have to do a lot more education of people within that space. Um, as it, as it relates to the duty to consult and accommodate and free prior and informed consent, that's where industry, indigenous leaders, um, municipalities and others need to be at the table to understand what the broader implications are of all of those pieces. Because if you talk about the free prior and informed consent, um, you have various number of spectrums. You have um, some indigenous um, leaders will feel that that means a veto. Others that are very pro-development means, no, it means free, prior, informed, right? Um, and and so, so that's, and then you have industry that say, okay, just tell us what the rules of the game are. What do we have to do? Um, and then ministries that issue permits and things are just in confusion oftentimes because, well, this indigenous partner doesn't agree, this one does. Industry is saying just get on with it. So the, the closer that those pieces in the UN declaration get to the ground, the more work that needs to get done. And that does fall on, on the plate of provinces, I think, that need to lead a lot of that work with indigenous partners, because that's the other shift too. Um, and we're seeing this across the board, not just in the indigenous space, but in, co in terms of co-design and co-management, right? We need to crowdsource things. We, need to, we can't just design a youth program um, in Queen's Park um, or on, on Wellesley Street instead of, instead of um, going out and talking to youth and figure out what they want. So, I mean, I think it's the way, we're all changing the way we do business and we need to bring people along and we're not dictating anymore. It's, we're side by side and sometimes we're following. I, I would say there's definitely um, maybe more awareness in terms of because of the government uh, leading things like mandatory curriculum and, and Treaty Week. Um, but I, I have to be honest, there's a complacency out there, um, especially when it comes to business and chambers of commerce and those folks that sit around those tables. It was a really difficult conversation when I was chief to try to manage the very many issues that really impacted provincial mandates, but also municipal mandates. And, and to be told that this was the first time they sat down with their local chief and, 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 and had these types of conversations. So 50 years is a long time to, read to, a, to reach a minimum state of consciousness. We, First Nations can't wait any longer. I, it really does have to go inward. I, I feel like 50 years is just a really bad track record. If you're just at the stage of going, aha, shoot, there's treaties around, we've done a poor job as Canada. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to give you an F on that one. Uh, we've been saying this for, you know, 300 years. And so 50 years is, you know, you might as well say two generations, three generations of young people whose complete aspirations and prosperity of well-being in this country has been lost. We can't afford another decade. And so consciousness has to happen, no doubt, as the first stage, but it needs action on the ground by everybody, including all of the civil servants that are out here. And all of you as family members, raising young children and raising your, your family. Um, because it has to go outside, not just the political forum, but also the, our neighborhoods and uh, go to any chamber of commerce and see how much they recognize their indigenous partners as economic partners. I, I'm, you're probably going to be, hard, it's going to be a far, you know, far and few places where they actually see their First Nation 
community on reserve that sits t like we are 20 minutes from London as an economic driver. Um, we see ourselves as economic driver. We've got a, a, you know, a significant amount of resource to employ as a result of three land claims. And yet, there's this idea about our ability or our capacity to be part, part of that. So awareness and all of that stuff is important, but then it's a changing of mindset that you actually don't see us as those poor people needing help but you actually see us as you know, that great, rich civilization that can bring to bear different innovation ideas and uh, realities about where this country can go in 50 years. And I think the environmental front is starting to, you can start to see some of those trajectories getting shifted because those voices are being amplified in indigenous communities. And that's just one sector. If we were to amplify them in all the sectors, I think, Maybe Canadians could see us differently, but I don't see that right now. I, I don't, I, it, it's really a difficult conversation at the ground level to have to just, I'm an educator by trade, I'm a teacher, I've, my whole career has been in education. Um, and, and I know the, the difference between pedagogy is between teaching a child and an adult. And, and these things take consistent, repeated effort of change and conversation and dialogue that one cultural proficiency workshop you're going to put on in your government institution is not going to be enough to get to the very heart, the very heart of the matter. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in agreement that this is, this is something that, that we should celebrate after 50 years. My dad's been elected counselor in Chippewa the Thames for 38 years. And I asked him before I came here today, Dad, what's changed in jurisdiction? He said, very little. People are still very aspirational at the federal and provincial levels. They, they produce a lot of government documents that say they're committed. There's proclamations all over the place. But when you really look on the ground at what we are actually in control of in communities, very, very little has changed. That's problematic. So I'm asking you, where are you going to come forward with a different way of doing things? Where are you going to come forward where you can sit across the table and actually look at somebody and say, that Anishinaabeg law can fit alongside Ontario laws, and we're going to figure out how to do it. And it has to happen at the cabinet. It's not a tweak of a current policy. So that would be my take on Canadian consciousness and Canadians feeling about Indigenous relations. I can feel it already, just the sense of this. The blanket keeps getting heavier each new presentation of this day. You know, I'm hanging on to every word, hoping someone's going to bring up Indigenous relations in their discussion, because then it must, it, it signals things matter. Um, you know, but I understand Canadians face a lot of issues. I understand that, and I understand that more as a result of being here. Um, but is that a good excuse for not dealing with that third pillar of people who should have been part of that founding nations of who Canada is? Absolutely not. Thank you. I'm going to take the liberty of asking one more question, but I encourage everyone to think now of, of, uh, of your questions and, and maybe answers to the, I think, because Leslie's asked a number of questions of us. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, my colleagues with the microphones are around, but let me just uh, uh, ask one more, which is the, the question of whether reconciliation, the word, the, the concept, is, is, is the right one for focusing. Uh, this discussion. Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly come to the fore in the last number of years. Deborah, your ministry has, has renamed itself to, to embrace the concept. And, you know, there's, there's a certain part of it that speaks, speaks to the rift, speaks to something that needs to be repaired, and so it seems appropriate. Um, but at, at the same time, I, I want to ask the question of whether it, there's a danger that it can get us on track. It also kind of speaks of compromise or or meeting in the middle in some way, and I'm not, I'm not sure if all Indigenous people would, would see that that's really what we need to talk about. So is it, is, should we be talking about rights, decolonization, treaties, basic standards of living, and so on? Like I, I'm just, is this the right channel for the water to flow through if we, if we talk about reconciliation as an idea? I've heard some people say reconciliation, um, and uh, you know whatever it is, there needs to be action. It can't just be lip service. So I mean, governments need to change the way they do business. So for example, even some little things that we've done that you know 
people don't think are a big deal, but they're a huge deal. So for example, we now have a chief actually sitting at the cabinet table. That would have been unheard of in the past. Um, we actually, ha I just did a panel for an assistant deputy minister, a hiring panel. I had an indigenous leader with me on that interview panel. Um, we changed the oaths of public servants so that all public servants um, will now swear or affirm that they will abide by Aboriginal treaty rights um, and Indigenous employees, should they choose, um, can waive their oath of allegiance to the Queen, which is very offensive to, to many Indigenous people. So slowly, you call it reconciliation, call it reconciliation, it, it's taking action and doing some things that are meaningful and it starts to make change in, in the system. Um, because I, I don't think we should get hung up on words. Um, reconciliation means a lot to me as an Indigenous person, but it might not mean something to someone else. But it only means something if people are going to do something about it. Both at an individual level, at the, at the dinner table with your families, talking to, talking to uh, your own loved ones, having conversations, increasing that awareness, to bringing it into the place that you work. Um, or the communities that you, you know, you go watch your kids hockey game or volleyball game and you're bringing that there and you're having those conversations. Um, so I don't, I, I don't think it's a stale word, but I think that some people can hang on to it at, at the expense of saying the motherhood statements instead of the actual action. Bob, do you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Deborah. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's about the word. I, I think, I mean, the one problem that I have with the word is that we often talk about people reconciling with something, meaning get used to it. Uh, you know, reconcile yourself to this. Um, that isn't what the word means to me. That isn't what reconciliation means at all. Uh, but it, it might be interpreted by some people as, as, as meaning that. Um, I, I just want to very much endorse what Leslie said earlier, and just 100%, and that is that, that um, until <coughs> the part... Is she okay? Is somebody yeah, okay there? Somebody okay. may have fallen over. Everyone's okay. Yeah. Um, I don't usually cause that kind of a <laughs> commotion. It must have been something I said. Um, <laughs> un until the Department of Finance and the Ministry of Finance are at the center of this, these issues, nothing much is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I always point out to people that there are, there are two um, watchwords that I, when I, I, I tell my clients. The first is follow the money, and the second is follow the lawyers. Um, and the reason I say that is because, uh, follow the money, because for all of the talk that we've seen over the last many, many years, um, money ha has not shifted in terms of the power relationships. Um, First Nations don't decide how much money gets spent on health care. They don't decide how much gets spent on education. They don't decide on, uh, on where the dollars will flow or what the dollars will be. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to get anywhere with respect to the dollars, um, First Nations have had to take governments to court over and over and over and over again. Um, and that takes me to my second fall of lawyers. Why? Why do we have all these great decisions from the Supreme Court telling governments what the rights of First Nations people are? Because the governments wouldn't do it. <laughs> Who is the defendant in every case? It's either the provincial or the federal crown. So right now, federal and provincial lawyers are fighting in court against First Nations on one issue or another. Now. Again, there are efforts being made to say, well, can we settle this? Can we negotiate it? How do we do it? But it's painfully slow. And the shifting of the argument around jurisdiction mm -hmm. and around not just saying the word treaty, but understanding the difficult problem that arises when governments say treaty means this and First Nations say treaty means that. First Nations and governments and the Crown are not agreed on what treaty means. All we've agreed on now is treaties matter, but nobody is saying, well, and this means this. And that, I think, is the, is the big <coughs> challenge that we, that we face. And so, just to add to what Leslie said, the problem is that governments 
the, the thing that's holding up the action is the cost, it's the money, and it's the power. Mm -hmm. And those two issues are still very, very much in contention. And that, I think, is what Leslie's dad was talking about. Yeah, very much. Is that when it comes to jurisdiction and money and real power and authority, not that much has changed. Now, I think other things have shifted. I've seen it during my political career and post-political career. I've seen things moving. But are they moving fast enough? No. And are there a lot of people who still don't get it and don't want to get it? Absolutely, yeah. yes, there are. And I mean, I, I hear from them regularly. They, they bombard me on Twitter. I hear from those folks yeah. and they don't get it. I do want to, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, a pragmatist, practical I, leader. I have this leadership style that just tells me like, just get her done in small baby steps because it will make the longest returns in the end. And so I do need to acknowledge uh, Kathleen Wynne's government here because the two years that I was chief, um, I, I, and, and all of my um, colleagues who are chiefs would tell me we've never had this type of access before. We've never been able to literally call somebody on the phone and talk to a minister directly to talk about a real critical local issue like this. We've not had these doors open. We've not been able to engage consistently over several amounts of time with them. And I felt that. And I actually am taking a model that we use in uh, work where uh, Chippewas is currently doing with the provincial government on what we would call unmarked um, tobacco product in which unfortunately the federal government um, has characterized in a recent change in a criminal code as trafficking of contraband tobacco. So we're in complete odds in terms of how we see economic development in our communities and economic diversification as a result of taking advantage of those, those um, really lively, vibrant sectors in our communities right now. And, um, but we've got a provincial government who's willing to sit down, create a forum which is safe for us to tell in the story in a way that actually moves the conversation to a harmonization of a self-regulated tobacco industry on reserve as in, in, in relation to the needs of the province. That, those are hard conversations to have, and not just on the provincial side in terms of being accountable to Ontarians, but for myself to be accountable to citizens of Chippewa the Thames when you start talking about levies and you start talking about royalty fees, and you start talking about relationships with, with province when you're supposed to be only talking to the crown. Those are really sensitive, super sensitive topics that you have to be able to manage around at the community level to get to the next step. And, and I'll, I'll have to, I have to give kudos to this government in terms of how they were able to create that space for us over the last four years to move that project along in very concerted ways, which in my mind is a 27, 2017 response to the question of how will we return jurisdiction back to communities? That's what we need to be looking for, are those places where those are happening. Um, they're always sensitive to be turned on their, they're like turned upside down in a moment. I, I get that, especially on really controversial topics like tobacco. Um, but the reality is we stuck long enough in the conversation to get to where we are now with an MOU and an understanding to move forward from both cabinet and from, from my council and our people. But it was done because of something like this, the vision of what that was happening in 67. You get people around in a conversation in a place where they're not having to, like someone said earlier, work from bullet points where they actually can talk openly about the very sensitive issues and how to solve them and find those gaps and doorways that nobody thought of because we stood long enough in a discussion to share it. That's how this, I feel, this project has been successful. And they've made their senior leadership available who actually have some authority to act on those very technical table meetings that are happening quite regularly. So they're not sending us the, um, first line civil servants, and no disrespect to all of you, I was one of them. <laughs> I worked at the Ministry of Education for eight years. I'm not saying that, I'm just saying that you need, especially on those topics of jurisdiction, you need to put your senior managers and your people who have some power and authority around those tables. Um, otherwise it won't be received as being taken seriously. So I, I think there are opportunities in governments to have 
a conversation with First Nation communities seeking a jurisdictional um, action plan to returning um, uh, decision making over on a number of sectors. And my job right now is to, is to, is to work with eight First Nations on education jurisdiction. And I'm gonna look to all of you and go, are you ready? Can we have a conversation? How can you help us do that? Because we're, we, 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 education in terms of what we want to see in our communities is not exactly on the same, um, same wavelength as Ontario's current education system. So who wants to take that up? Do you? <laughs> I, that's the reality of the work. You really, someone out there has to say, yeah, let's figure it out. I'd like to open it up then for uh, questions uh, from you. Uh, I'm not sure where our microphones are, but we need some hands up so we at least get in there. Our microphones are here, so we... This is two, two questions, conveniently located one next to the other. Thank you, and thank you to the panel. Uh, <clears throat> Charles Beer with a bit of a throat. Um, I think this has been tremendously uh, illuminating what you've said and the kind of challenges ahead. Um, <clears throat> as I listen, um, one of the things that really is of concern to me is for that large number of people who have no idea <clears throat> of, of what is, is out there and what we need to deal with. And I try to think of, well, what are the strategies that can help us? And, and I by no means saying that some of the things that have been done are not important, they are. Uh, s some of us here will remember uh, during all the issues that are related to uh, Quebec and language, um, Key Spicer led a, a, a project that went around the country and it was to have town halls to try to get people engaged and to begin to <coughs> understand issues uh, uh, that would affect th that question. How, how might we begin to really engage um, more of the broader Canadian population uh, in, in coming forward and understanding uh, these, these issues. I mean, you mentioned about the uh, difficulty, uh, Leslie, with uh, chambers of commerce and, and that they're very important and, and so on. Uh, obviously, uh, schools, but there, there are many other. I mean, the, the service clubs, however you want to find Canadians. But it just seems to me that uh, particularly on the, the broad number of issues that relate to really making uh, progress, we, we do, and, and, and you spoke to the urgency of it, and we don't have 25 years to let people slowly understand. So I just wonder, have, you know, perhaps in, in terms of um, uh, government, Deborah, that there's some other things that are, are planned, and Bob, <coughs> through your work with uh, a, a whole slew of uh, different uh, First Nations and, and the work you do, Leslie, are there other things that you could share with us or things that we should be talking about as we go back to our our own communities and the various groups and organizations with which uh, uh, we're working and living. I, if I can just uh, just say a word, I mean, I think Charles, I think um, that I th maybe this is just reflecting my own my own bias, my own view. But my my view has been that for a long time, uh, the key objective should have been self-government. And that means creating the effective units of self-government. So if you're going to devolve educational jurisdiction, you've got to have a large enough group of people who can work together to create that capacity for self-government. That's what's being started now in the, in, uh, in the far north on health care, is saying, OK, let's get people together and talk about how are we going to do this differently, because whatever we've been doing so far hasn't worked very well. I think that actually that's one way in which Canadians will agree to say, do you think things are going well? And I think everyone will say no, like obviously not, because of, and they will come up with different examples and different reasons. But to me, when it comes to, uh, you know, what is, the, what is the critical objective? I don't think it makes a lot of sense to have 
a, a commission for the sake of a commission or a discussion for the sake of a discussion. I think the discussion has to be about something. And to me, the something is this issue of self-government and jurisdiction. And I'm, I can just say that in one file that I've been working on, perhaps not the one you're thinking of, we have actually made an enormous advance in provincial policy on recognition of Aboriginal jurisdiction for First Nations higher education. There have been in existence in this <coughs> province institutes that, of higher learning that have never been recognized properly by either government. And we went to the government four years ago and said, this has got to be done. And the government said, let's talk. And last year we started formally a process that's called co-creation. We would co-create a policy. And that is now in, in about to be second reading in the, in the legislature of Ontario. And that's taken us a long time. Under the radar screen, not a lot of people knew about it, but there's been a very explicit recognition by the government of Ontario that they will not impose a policy, they will co-create a policy. And I'm now becoming an evangelist for co-creation. Not procreation, co-creation. <laughs> co-creation because it respects each other's jurisdiction and because it recognizes that the cabinet will not just consult, but will actually engage in a, in a policy of genuine partnership in co-creating a policy. It's arduous, it's hard, it's argumentative. Mm -hmm. uh, some days you feel we're not getting anywhere and slowly but surely through the government with leadership, which is so important, leadership of the premier has been absolutely critical on this file. We've actually been able to move departments and move people to say, okay, we accept it. So if I was to say anything, <laughs> either provincially or federally, what do we have to talk to people about? We have to talk to people, not about poverty only, not about housing only, not about water only. We have to talk about why do these, how have these things happened? And what do we need to do to transfer power and authority to those people who are most affected by what is not going right and not going well. And you have to give, I don't mind using the word decolonization, but you have to tell Canadians what that means. Because the difference between every other decolonization in the world is that the colonizers leave. <laughs> and the colonizers are not leaving, they're here, we're here, we're here, here we are. So the question becomes, how do we make this process of transferring jurisdiction, power and authority and capacity, how do we make that real? And that is the step that we've been waiting to take. I would argue we were ready to take it in 92 with Charlottetown, but Charlottetown was defeated. And so that issue has never gone away. It's never disappeared. Some governments take it up, other governments don't take it up. We now have, in Ontario, we now have a federal and a provincial government that are ready to take it up. And that's made a huge difference, and that's what allowed it to happen. But actually doing it, and for people to say, ah, oh, okay, so that means I don't have as much automatic authority as the Minister of Natural Resources over the resources of the province that I thought I had. And you say, yes, that's right, you don't. You thought you had it, but you don't have it. And now you're going to have to figure out how that really works. So it's, it's, it's all about those, those relationships. I see. Do you want to... Yeah, I would add that, and not to pick on the journalists in the room, and I hope, Doug, you aren't the article I'm referring to, but I know I read one of yours in preparing for today. Um, like, I read the, an article editorial in the Globe and Mail about um, Spain and Catalonia and their, their struggles. And in there, it, it, it talked about how Canada, they should have come and talked to Canada about um, how they deal with dissension and separatism because um, Canada has been able to actually maintain a peace in terms of how those, um, how those relations should be handled. And, and I read that and I said, that's not actually correct because they, they talked about how, how um, unfortunate it was that Spain chose force 
rather than diplomacy in that exchange there. And, but Canada chooses force when it comes to First Nation dissension. And it has consistently over many decades. And, and for whatever reason, we're not getting included in that narrative at that level about Canada in terms of its, its, it's always couched in a very specific indigenous frame when that piece would have lent itself to, oh, but by the way, we do call in and we double up as federalism. We, the provincial OPP gets called and so does the military. We work together on, it, on things like that when the First Nations um, are up in arms, right? So federalism for us doesn't work in those cases. It, it, it actually compounds the issue because now we're dealing with two military structures in response to a dissentive issue where we've raised arms. And so, um, it, it, but for the most part, federalism does work for us for the very reasons we're describing here. We've, we've got provinces that are just out of the gate in terms of how they're going to construct their relationship with First Nations, including, I believe, Ontario. And so, um, for, for the, in that regard, um, federalism is, is, is a, is a it, it does work in this time and age and where we're at in terms of our colonial and tra traumatic history with the federal government and, and their policies, poor policies. Um, what, ha what has to happen, though, is the Fed's got to get to the table. And <laughs> I, for education jurisdiction, in this work I've been doing over the last four months, the Feds at the table are the people that are responsible for the program that's already in place, telling us that we need a regional body of education that we delegate our authority to. That's not what we're saying. We can't talk to you about that because you're not on the same page. Oh, sorry, but if you're looking for resources, then you're going to have to follow under those things. Can we talk to somebody else? Oh, we don't have a mandate to do that. Well, you've been saying it since, you know, your whole platform has been talking about nation-to-nation -nation relations. How do you not have a mandate? You know, we're getting that now. And, and as of December 7th, I'm hopeful. There's been a resolution passed at the Chiefs of Assembly in, uh, in regards to support of a, a new policy proposal going before Cabinet on education formula funding. Um, and rethinking about what they believe about regional delegated bodies of authority, which we're happy to hear. So maybe, I think maybe it's just now the implementation stage is starting, um, but boy, that's gonna put us long over an election cycle. And all of that w work of reconciliation or getting to the table and talking about reconciliation will come undone if, if we don't get the same government in, I'm guessing, I don't know. Deborah. So just two additional things that I'd like to add. I mean, the first is, I think that bureaucracy inertia is, um, you know, is, is a problem because oftentimes the, the wrong people are going to the table um, without mandates, without money, without an ability to mm -hmm. think outside the box. And it goes to basic innovation, right? We create this environment where we say we want to be, we want to lead with innovation, but we really don't. Um, and people are penalized for failing. So I think the governments need to do a better job in terms of innovation. But the second is about, um, back to your question about public awareness. I think that, yes, we don't want to saddle people with the statistics and the poverty, but I think that most people in Toronto would be absolutely outraged that there's a community in the north that has no running water of 3,000 people, right? Um, that it's unacceptable that people can't turn on their tap and drink water. Like, a lot of people are really concerned. So sometimes, yes, showing the broader vision about where are we going and why are we doing this and, 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 and what happened to get there. I think that's important. But sometimes the issues resonate for people. So whether it's the suicide rates, whether it's the drinking water, those things. So I think that, you know, the more we can increase awareness about some of those issues, those are people that work in governments and work in hospitals and you know, work in, in, in um, health clinics that start to understand and, and, and create an awareness around those issues and hopefully feed into the changing of policy. But um, I think that we could do a lot more in terms of public awareness. But again, the media, not to bash the media, but sometimes the media only also focuses on the negative stories that are sensationalized, like Attawapiskat, and not to say that that's not a big story, because it is, um, but there's a lot of um, really great 
um, stories that are happening in the Indigenous community too. So sometimes mainstream Canadians get sick and tired of just hear, seeing negative stories, but because it's not newsworthy, I guess. But you know, there's a lot of really fantastic stories out there, and those should be celebrated a little bit more too. I think there's John, and then uh, two other questions here. Uh, th this is a not a challenge. It's a real, honest to goodness question that I don't know the answer to. If you go up to 25 St. Clair, I think it is, um, where the uh, regional office for INAC is, they, on a table they have um, several copies available to pick up of the Indian Act. Um, at occasion, um, to actually sit there and go through it, read it through, and uh, I'd encourage everybody to do that. It's, it's absolutely racist. It's not even neo-colonial, it's just colonial. It doesn't allow any but he'd own anything, as we heard last night. Uh, I'm just wondering, why do we not repeal it, or bring it up to date, or change it? Just an honest to goodness question. Uh, <laughs> Who wants to take that one? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, yeah, why? I, I, it's, you know, we talk about at the community le uh, level disentanglement from bureau uh, legislation. And um, so my answer to that, because I'm not a, a federal elected uh, leader um, who really needs to answer to that, um, is that our response to that is um, we will continue to um, assert our jurisdictions um, as we understood them before pre, you know, pre-confederation. Our relationship was with the British for us in Chippewa and London area. You know, all of those treaties were signed with the British. And, and so this kind of overlaying of this confederation framework was not ours to be, begin with, and nor did it actually consider the fact that you, maybe you don't really have the authority to do that because there's treaties here that are situating the work and how those things should be um, understood. So at the, in response to why not Indian Act, we're doing at the community level lawmaking that's I guess the laws were already there. I don't want to suggest we're making up laws. Like I said earlier, the, we have our natural law, spirit law, people's laws in terms of how we conducted ourselves in, in, uh, in society. But what we're doing is modernizing, modernizing them. We're in the process of constitution building at the community level. And so, oh, well, whatever happens over there, we're still just going to assert ourselves and continue to do the work we need to do in terms of sovereign, sovereign entities. Um, that's our response to that. Uh, from a government perspective, I'm not, I'm not sure why. I, and I can guess why, but um, I'll just keep my mouth shut. So, so again, I don't work for the federal government, so the Indian Act is a federal piece of legislation. It's the oldest piece of legislation, I think, in Canadian history. It's one of the, the first pieces of legislation. I think that um, why hasn't it been repealed? Because um, there's so many things that are built upon it. So communities function that way. It's how land tenure is. And governments over the years have, have made attempts to kind of do things on the side of it or add on to it. Um, but I think until there's replacement, which are the things that Leslie's talking about, the creation of own laws, self-government, then people opt out. I think that there's a lot of mistrust, rightfully so, on the part of Indigenous leaders about, okay, if you repeal that, then what? You know, are you taking away all of our rights? And a lot of people are hanging on to that because it defines who an Indian is, right? It defines how, how law is leased and, and, I mean, how land is leased and how land tenure is. And, um, you know, on my own reserve, I can't own land, right? On my husband's reserve, you know, I, I can't own our house. My, house. my name's not on our house because of the Indian Act. So, um, you know, I, I think that there's... And, and I think there's been attempts over the years um, to make changes, but when those attempts have been made, like I think of the First Nations Governance Act, they weren't done with in terms of the co-management and co-design. So then, of course, everybody's back gets up, whether it's a good piece of legislation or not. You have to do things jointly right from the beginning, and then you'll get a different, definite, different outcome. And Bob gives a great example around the Indigenous Institutes legislation. Four years ago, it was an idea. Boom! It's it's in second reading in the in the legislature. So, um, and that's because of co-development and co-design. Uh, I think there are a couple of. I mean, the, the last one of my the last things I did as an MP was to move a private member's motion that would have got rid of the Indian Act, and it 
was defeated. Um, sort of looks, it's basically the story of my political career with one, one or two exceptions. Um, uh, but um, I think there, I think it's, 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 it's a little complicated. I'm going to try and try, because I'm fascinated by the question. And I, I, if I had my druthers, I'd blow it up. I'd blow the whole structure to smithereens. I'd get rid of INAC. I'd just, just say, look, this, these structures have to go. You can't have Indian, Aboriginal self-government, Indigenous self-government without civil servants, without a governance structure. You're asking bands to run things when they have, they have no actual governance underneath them that allows them to do that. And so there's a whole shift that needs to happen if you're really going to engage in a, in a shift of power relationships. Why don't we do it? Uh, why, why are governments, well, they tried it, and Mr. Trudeau tried it, the white paper, 1968. You know, you go back and read it. Talk about reading things. Get rid of the Indian Act. It's a paternalistic, anachronistic piece of legislation. The First Nations should uh, establish relations with the province. And you heard Leslie's view about, you know, what happened, what's the view of the, the provinces? They're not even the crown. Where they are, in fact, the crown, but they're not seen as the crown by a lot of First Nations. No. And so they don't want to just be dependent on the province. So in order to effectively change this, to manage it, apart from you know, rhetorically just you know, blowing it up, you, you need to say, well, what's next? Or what do we do in parallel with that? What are the structures we're creating? And, and then I, and I, I believe strongly that the federal government should be engaging in a discussion with the, the First Nations about, okay, how do we actually shift this ground successfully? And I think, in fact, the provinces will have to be involved in that discussion because one of the things that's very clear is that the provinces are more and more engaged. What's the key difference between this issue today than it was in 1967, 68? The provinces had nothing to, nothing to say about it. And nothing, and and really, were hardly had a ministerial capacity to deal with it. There was no minister at any provincial level. There was no minister who had responsibility for Aboriginal and Indian, Indigenous issues. Not one. It was all handled by the federal government, and and then the ministries all dealt with welfare or education or whatever they had to deal with, but they weren't involved. Now this structure, the whole thing is changing. But there's no question that we should continue as a country to be absolutely outraged by the fact that we have a piece of legislation which is at the heart of the relationship between the federal government and uh, indigenous people, which is colonial, which is racist, uh, and which uh, has, as far as I'm concerned, no no, nothing you can say that this is what's good about it. You know, this is what we're, this is what we've now made of it. And the, in my opinion, the, among the worst things that the Indian Act has done is it's divided indigenous people among themselves. It's created units of governance that were intended to divide and conquer and that have prevented and made it much more difficult for First Nations to come together. I work in the field, and I can tell you, my, and don't tell, keep this a secret, but this between us, but the diff, most difficult challenges that I face are not necessarily with the crown. Yeah. The biggest challenges that I face are getting people to work together yeah. because they have been institutionalized into thinking that they're, it's them versus a neighbor who's 50 miles away. Mm -hmm. And it's nuts, but it's very powerful. And that to me is the worst thing that the Indian Act has done. And it's also one of the reasons why the Indian Act is hard to get rid of, because you've created 656 governments. Okay, you governance experts out there, how easy is it, is it to say to government X, uh, you know, we want to change your powers a little bit. It, it creates a problem. And this is a problem that is at the heart of where we need to be in the next 50 years is part of the debate has to be about what is going to be the nature of indigenous self-government. It isn't going to be the Indian Act. The Indian Act is not the basis for anything. Mm 
it's been a disaster, but unfortunately it's a disaster that some people are getting used to, which is yeah. not good. I would add that, um, agree with Bob that um, the other part of this, uh, the other side of the coin is revenue sharing. Yes. And um, because um, we're, we're, I believe more and more so, there's still work to be done as Bob pointed out in terms of capacity. Um, but that's where the partnership and allyship could come in, is how to work the money in Canada in a way yep. that we are creating pockets that are reproducing the returns that we need to actually run our own governments. I know at Chippewa, our, our goal is, you know, we need to break free from these, these tentacles and, and, and just build our own revenue source with which to create our own economies, with which to contribute to the larger regional body of, of economy but at the same time have enough money to do the things we need to do to address the issues we need to address the way we want to. And, and so, but revenue sharing is a difficult conversation to have. Uh, again, uh, kudos to this government because they, they came to the table talking about revenue sharing. They did when the Ontario Limited Partnership came up with regards to gaming uh, revenues in Ontario, which has put an incredible amount of resources to bear in each community that they turn around and actually feed into sport. I know at Chippewa... What we government it. did that? Over, you know? Pardon? Can you remember? Okay. I'm only kidding. You. <laughs> 2007. <laughs> we, 2007. Pardon? It was 2007. Was it 2007? No, 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 but the original revenue sharing out of, out oh. of casinos was in 1992. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So there's that example. Wins here. Yeah, and it was a hard sell, right? It was a hard negotiation, and um, but in the end, that that agreement's going to come to an end in, ten, in like seven years, eight years. And how do we capitalize on all of that money? Um, and did we use it wisely in each of those communities? Did we build a tree, or did we be just kind of cutting the tree every year? I know at Chippewa, we've been cutting the tree down every year. So we have not built that capacity um, in terms of turning over money repeatedly within the community. And so, um, so that's another. That's why I keep picking on the Chamber of Commerces and, and the um, the whole the, the finance. I, I agree with Bob. The finance ministers. I was happy to be sitting beside one. I wish I would have had more time with Janet. You know, what were you thinking? And how does it work? And how come? And um, just because uh, because we and we leverage and we're learning through land claim settlements. Um, there's a there's a stipulation. You got to create a community trust agreement to go with these things. And out of that, you have to be a trustee and you have to manage them. I, you know, those are things that we've developed in communities in terms of how to manage you know, multi-million dollars in order to push that forward seven generations. Those are the kinds of things that communities really only want to be doing and not be begging and begging and spending year by year reporting, no multi-year, nothing to plan beyond a two, three year cycle. It's just, it's just set up to fail. It's so set up to fail a two-year cycle of election um, that is just completely set up to fail, and that's the Indian Act for you. So, um, no, the, land, the revenue sharing side has to be a real uh, option on the table across every province, and uh, federal, federal as well. We're just, uh, just about an, out of time, but I know Andrea had uh, a question, so let's take one more, one more question, and uh, we can wrap up on that. I want to talk, thank the panel very much for coming today and for sharing some more information. I am retired. Uh, I have the good fortune to have attended a third age uh, lecture series put on in Barrie. And it was to educate non-Indigenous people about Indigenous culture. I am astounded by the layers and the depth and the differences. I am really appreciative of many of the things that your culture can bring to ours. When I think about reconciliation, um, and the name of the, the lecture series, which I thought was quite good, was Reconciliation for Whom? And um, most of the people, I would venture to say that probably 98% of the audience were retired people, my age group, and white. And they are very keen to learn. And um, I think that the, probably out of that lecture series, 
a number of people would be prepared to actually take action. Because at the end of that lecture series, the question really was, okay, now you've heard all this, who of you will walk out of this room prepared to make an effort? And I think it's going to take a huge effort. I think that when I think about reconciliation, I also think there can be no reconciliation without what you have been discussing today, co-creation. Mm -hmm. Because until there is co-creation, the society will not reflect um, a position of embracing collectively everyone. I think also um, that there is still such a separation of thinking between non-Indigenous, and I can only talk about the white community, my age group, I, I don't know what the New Syrians, uh, their position is. But what has struck me is when we talk about treaties, first of all, all of us need to go home also and read about treaties in Canada. Uh, what are they? What do they contain? What areas do they cover? But I also think that the, there's a real missing link in ownership. So the attitude I hear in the non-Indigenous white population, again, of um, basically my age group, and, and maybe I don't know what the youngest people are, are thinking these days, because I, I think you're just introducing education now about a, a Aboriginal communities at the very young levels. But I think that it comes as a shock to people in my group that the treaty actually is not something that's all about you. The treaty is about all of us. We are as much a part of that treaty as it, 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 it shapes our lives as much as it's shaping yours. So I think it's important that my group also understand that we're, we're not excluded from that experience. We're not excluded from that uh, description that we're part of that. So I think there's a huge amount of education that, that needs to, to happen yet. Mm -hmm. That the, that certainly the, it, it's, I heard someone the other day say, gosh, you know, there's a lot of stuff coming up now. You're really hearing a lot about Aboriginal people. I wonder why that is. <laughs> well, if that is the question that's being raised and it's a surprise, then I think that also reflects the amount of education that is required, mm -hmm. and and this, and also I think it's really important the sense of ownership. We're all in it together. It doesn't just shape your side; it shapes my side. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it does. And so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe just a last word to Deborah and to Leslie, if you want to help us wrap this up. Yeah, I'll just start by saying that we're all treaty people. Uh, there's a, in fact, there's many books by that title. We are all treaty people. Mm -hmm. the, the problem, however, is that the treaty means different things to different people. And that is what I call the, the trillion dollar misunderstanding uh, about the treaties that we, we, we have to debate and have to, have to understand. But for me, the under, even if you know, even if there is a difference of opinion about what is what does the treaty mean exactly, for me the key thing about the treaties, and this is very much what the court has been saying, is that it is a solemn undertaking uh, by two peoples that they will have a relationship. So it's about peoples recognizing the status, you don't, I mean, treaties are a document between nations. We think of international treaties, we think, of, and that's how we should be thinking of them. Um, and, and that means that two peoples have, have a relationship. It's a relationship that we have to understand has gone terribly wrong in historically, and in many ways still today, it's, it's not good. And we see signs of that everywhere, all the time. But there's still this, this thing that we should, we should cling on to and build, 
which is that there is a relationship. And that means we have to build from the ground up what is the modern meaning of the relationship. We have to renew and modernize the treaty relationships. We can't, as, as Mr. Trudeau Sr. tried to do, just set them aside. We can't do that. Court won't let us do it. It's not the right thing to do anyway. We can't ignore them, but we have to turn them into living, breathing relationships that actually work and are respectful. But in order for that to happen, it is going to require that the significant majority of Canadians, 95% of the population, understand that this is what it means to be a Canadian. And I just say to the group, if you want to read one book, read Peter Russell's latest book, which is called The Canadian Odyssey. It's the first, it's the first book about the Canadian Constitution that really looks at all of the elements of the, of the Federation, all of the elements of the country, and puts the Aboriginal experience at the heart of this question. And I think that's, that's something which I personally have believe in very, very strongly, is that we need, we need to understand that there, there were people living on this land for thousands and thousands of years before colonization. That history did not start in 1492 or 1535 or 1604 or 1763 or 1867 or 1982. It began before recorded memory, but it began with governments and with languages and with ways of life that the colonizers never respected and treated as truly equal and worthy of their dignified attention. And so that's what we have to do. And it's tough. As uh, Murray Sinclair said, the truth will set you free, but first it will really piss you off. And I'm afraid that's true. I, I, I want to give you an example, and I want to tell you, I'm, I'm hoping that you might think about this in terms of your own roles and how it is so important that you leave the work up into the communities. This was 15 years ago. Our community knew we had a huge challenge ahead of us in terms of um, helping our families become healthier. We were seeing great success as the young people picked their bundles up and were going to ceremony and traveling great distances to go find these elders who had these knowledges and had these, these, the language and had the ceremony and protocols. And, um, and they were going at their own expense and many couldn't take advantage of that because they had just had no resources to get to Sault Ste. Marie or Wisconsin or um, Michigan or Minnesota or you know the different places that we gather as Anishinaabek people. And, and um, Chippewa, we saw the returns, you know, by somebody attending ceremony regularly, whole families were breaking cycles and rehealing. And it wasn't a prescribed drug that was going to do it. And, and so, but any conversations we have with health officials about the fact that we really need money to help people get to be in front of elders, that's not a qualifiable expense in programs. We, we really need money to host more powwows and gatherings and celebrations where we come together and, you know, in, in um, drug-free, alcohol-free ways that reinstitute our ceremonies. That's not an eligible expense. Sorry about that. And so it's those kind of things where we see the greatest return for, is for very little money, if you look at it, where people are touching their bundles again, they're lifting their, their work in terms of their roles as elders, as fire keepers, as water keepers, as um, knowledge keepers, you know, all of those things that maybe in an economic conversation nobody can understand in terms of moving Canada forward 50 years from now, but in terms of health and well-being and feeling good and having a purpose in life, all those things, those things build incredible communities. And, and you're not working, you know. So anyway, I, my, my plea to you is that trust that we know exactly what we're doing in our communities. 
and think about how you're, you're setting forward your parameters on what you think good health is or good education or good transportation, infrastructure, whatever it is. And, and trust that there's somebody on the other side table who's been thinking about this for a really long time and have come up with some solutions if you're willing to sit down and figure it out. Um, so we created a healing journey policy. It's funded through a OLG dollars. It's $20,000 investment. Every year we put it in, $20,000. You've put an application together. You say you're going to Minnesota pipe ceremony. We're going to pay for you to get there and give you a little bit of food money to go there and come back. And we've had families new and new every year take advantage of that and find who they are and build that identity with which they build the confidence to be all of what you're describing in terms of where you want Canadians to go. So, but that has to happen at the community level. And so I, I'm, I guess I'm compelling you to, to look for those examples and trust that in fact maybe a straight fiscal transfer where we design our own programs, we develop our own ways, our strategic plans might actually in the end save a lot of money. Um, so I guess that would be the, the last thing I would say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please join me in, uh, in thanking, uh, thanking all three panelists. So I may have misled people because I think I promised a, a longer break in the afternoon. In the end, we'll have as short a break as, as we can. I think the next panel is ready to go, but we we'll give people kind of five minutes again to quickly refresh, but please come back great. as soon as you can, um, and we'll get the next part of the, the program going as soon as we can. After this week.